Hello and welcome to the Partly Political Broadcast, the comedy politics podcast that has never kissed a Tory, for it only kisses ears, you know, with sound and your consent to do so. Wait, come back, come back. I'm Tian and Duyeb, but this week, as rumours suggest the British government seek a Swiss-style deal with the EU, I thought we already had that. Isn't that why it's full of holes? Nothing turns eyes towards a country's ethics quite like the Men's World Cup. The tournament has only just begun, and it's transparent just how prejudicial, unequal, greedy, out-of-date, meek and driven by ideology England are. Oh, sorry, and Qatar aren't great either. At least we let people die unfairly without having to do construction work first, right? Ours get to keel over in their own homes, and then have their bodies naturally preserved by the lack of heating, which really saves the mortuaries time and energy. We are very thoughtful. The England team might have the three lions on their shirts, but would a lion back down from wearing a One Love rainbow armband in protest against Qatar's homophobic abusive policies? Well, yes, I mean, probably, but only because I just can't imagine you'd get an armband on a lion without having to tranquilise it first. It'd be a terrifying job. That's not really the point, though. What I mean is, when faced with showing the world that you stand in solidarity with the promotion of human rights, it's not the bravest thing to say, actually, we'd prefer not to piss off FIFA and make sure we can add to our wealthy salaries by playing against Wales on a rainy day in January, as that's much more important. A truly brave bunch of lions would say, fine, we won't wear an LGBTQ plus solidarity symbol, but then as soon as they score, add to the shirtless hugging with some deep tongue kissing and intense groping. Or, you know, they could have just boycotted the whole tournament in the first place. But I guess that just would have been too much protesting for England, wouldn't it? On the first match England played against Iran, where they won many, many nil, the Iranian team refused to sing the national anthem, which could put their lives at risk when they return home. Whereas in comparison, some of the England team just sang God Save the Queen instead of changing the words to King. So maybe that is a stand against hate crimes towards drag artists, but I think it's far more likely they've just not even watched the news in years. We are a nation of small, pointless gestures only, or not at all. Which I suppose is why we have a government like the Conservatives who reflect this value in abundance. The Prime Minister and boy who put his hand up to read everything in class, even though no one else wanted him to, Rishi Sunak, tweeted a video of him filling in his World Cup chart and putting it on the door of his office at number 10. In perhaps the only time anyone has ever made covering the flat in gold leaf wallpaper look more appealing. Do us proud, tweeted Sunak with an England flag emoji, and I suppose by not protesting about abuses of human rights, the England team are indeed doing that. And if they could also rob some poor people, pay no tax, spend a silly amount of money on pointless endeavours while refusing to apologise and lacking all sense of humour, then really they could very well be our ambassadors in not just football, but everything. Sadly, of course, though, several of the England players have already stood up for hungry children, so it's very likely the Prime Minister doesn't mean those ones. Chancellor and stressed Eric on Ket, Jeremy Hunt, said he tried to be fair with his autumn statement that he did last week. I mean, he wasn't, but again, it's the thought that counts, isn't it? Why be fair when you can simply tell people you've really tried, but it just wasn't doable on account of an innate desire to make everyone's lives much worse? We must remember it's not easy for someone like Jeremy Hunt to insist that we all pay a bit more tax, by which he means a bit as to how rich people see a bit, but for you it'll be you have to survive the winter by eating your own shoes, like if John Franklin hadn't bothered looking for the North West Passage and instead had just stayed at home and tried to reduce his heating bill. The Chancellor made the difficult decisions now, he said, rather than later when everyone would have had a chance to analyse them and show actually they weren't very difficult or indeed helpful in any way. What is this insistence from Tory ministers about making difficult decisions? I've said it before on this podcast, but seriously, just do the easy ones. Give everyone more cash and then have a day off. No one would mind at all. It seems completely worthless to struggle over something if no one's going to like it anyway. What exactly was difficult about saying young people face a decade of lost growth while rich pensioners will be fine anyway? Hunt and the rest of the government have had 12 years of performances of that statement already. You'd think they'd know it really well by now. If Jeremy Hunt is still struggling to wheel out exactly the same old shit he's already previously been in government for, then maybe this isn't the job for him. Sack it off, mate, and go somewhere where there are no difficult decisions, like one of those jobs where all you have to do is raise or lower a barrier at a car park. Now, I'm sure he'd refuse to let anyone in and insist it was better that he made that hard choice now rather than later when everyone realised there was more than ample space for car parking and he was just being a fucking beady-eyed arsehole about it. What was actually in the autumn statement? Well, you'll be very excited to hear that the minimum wage for over 23-year-olds is increasing by nowhere near the rate of inflation, but it is increasing, so be grateful, you'll now earn slightly more not enough money to eat from. 
If you're under 23, then look, it's your fault for being born and you should have thought about this beforehand. But also don't go on benefits because they want everyone to be in work. Except rich pensioners, forget about them, or landlords, or rich pensioner landlords. But apart from them, everyone needs to work. Benefits will increase with inflation, giving anyone on universal credit £600 more, which is really going to help with the £1,040 the government took away from them after the pandemic, in the same way handing someone a tent would be a nice pick-me-up after you demolish their home. Jeremy Hunt has also given the DWP £280 million to crack down on benefit fraud, which is currently 0.07% of all claims, so money well spent. And I guess that either suggests the DWP are particularly shit at investigating all of, what, three people a year, or they'll only do it if they can drink the most expensive champagne while filing papers. Taxes going up for everyone except banks who get the surcharge on their profits, cut from 8% to just 3%, and that's going to allow them to help the economy by using that extra money to give to themselves and get even fancier paper to write the fee for your increased overdraft letter on. It's funny, isn't it, that when Rishi Sunak said he'd fix the mistakes of his predecessor, it turns out the only mistake helium-filled tea towel Liz Truss made when saying bankers would keep more of their bonuses was that she said it out loud instead of hiding it deep in a much bigger statement. If you're a middle-income learner, you're going to lose a lot of money. If you're a low-income earner, you're going to have an even worse time than now. And if you're a high-income earner, let's face it, you'll probably be paying someone else to worry about how many staff you'll have to sack so you can spend six months of the year on holiday. There are a lot of stealth taxes, which is terrible news for ninjas, and public spending is being put through the shredder, except the NHS and education, who are being given just enough money to stay afloat in the sea for a little bit longer before they drown, realising no one is really coming to save them. Jeremy Hunt is insistent that the rich are going to have to make larger sacrifices, but he could just mean that over 300,000 excess deaths from the last bout of austerity wasn't quite enough, so they're going to have to work really hard to make this bout worth it to appease the Tory voters. Surely all this worsening of living standards is worth it because it will get rid of that economic black hole that isn't there, right? Even though, you know, we could also not go through this and collectively say that's not a black hole, you're just looking too deeply into your own pisshole eyes in the mirror, Jeremy. And this budget isn't going to fix the black hole that doesn't exist anyway. The head of the Confederation of Business Industry has said that the Chancellor has done nothing to actually help growth, and the Office for Budget Responsibility have said GDP will only increase by 2024 half the amount that they previously forecast. Yeah, well, who wants a big GDP anyway? Then we'd have to find somewhere to put it, and there's enough of the housing crisis as it is. The OBR went one step further and dared to mention the B word. No, not bastards, which also would have been apt, but Brexit, saying that our trade intensity, and I think that's the glare that you give the person who's handing you the goods and what level of Hans Zimmer track is playing at the time, that is 15% lower than if we'd remained in the EU and our economy is fucked accordingly. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. Is it because we're now having to all believe in a black hole that isn't there, it's now okay to reveal that our previous beliefs created by a bus also weren't substantial? I mean, it was a bus. It had to be trustworthy, right? They're the ones we wave down if the police are about to murder us. We are going to have the sharpest GDP decline in Europe in 2023, but that's good, right? I mean, it sounds like a European word anyway, GDP, and I'm pretty sure real Brits just have GBP. Am I right? I'm definitely an expert on such things because I once read a reply to a tweet where someone said they knew what they were talking about and their avatar was a cow with a Union Jack painted on it and you can do your own research. Has the Brexit ship now sailed? That is a very hard tongue twister to say. And of course it hasn't because it would have too many forms to fill in at the harbour and then they'd fire all the staff so they could hire overseas workers on even lower pay. It's not a good sign, is it, when former Environment Secretary and cross between a gnome and the last man in the office on a Friday, George Eustace, told the Commons last week that the UK-Australia deal was actually a failure for the UK. I mean, that's not what he said at the time, but he had a job to keep, and why stand up for better standards of living when you could miss out on getting bullied at a Cabinet office meeting on a rainy day in January? Eustace said overall the UK gave away far too much for too little in return. Oh, but that's because we're hella generous, right? I mean, here Australia have full access to our beef and sheep markets, but don't worry about paying for it. You gave us neighbours for years and we'll just have some of those biscuits our floppy head crash test dummy of a leader likes. That'll do. And that's what we do all the time, isn't it? You know, hey Dido, here's £37 billion. No, don't worry about an app that actually works. Just have a lovely time with your horses. Oi, friend of a friend of a friend, have several million pounds for PPE. What is it? Oh, don't worry about it. Just have a great weekend and send over some bin bags when you get two minutes. See, we're just a very giving, generous bunch. I mean, not with benefits. And if you even think about messing with them, the DWP will send their newly acquired Ed 209 to kick your fucking face off. Over the weekend, the government did their usual tactic of leaking an idea in the press to see if anyone liked it before then retracting it very quickly again. This time, it was the possibility of changing our Brexit deal to more of a Swiss-style arrangement, but not in the way we currently have it, which is so it's basically like we signed our own euthanasia agreement. 
they meant more the sort of relationship that the EU currently hates and is trying to rearrange with Switzerland, but I suppose it could really have helped with the deficit if we'd managed to get it and wangle some Nazi gold out of it. After most hard Brexiteer politicians who won't be happy unless we spend millions shifting the entire country further west into the Atlantic, after they all complained about such a possibility, the Prime Minister very publicly backtracked on such a deal being considered. I believe in Brexit, said Sunak, like a car salesman insisting he was giving you the best vehicle around as he hands over the keys to something that's half BMX bike, half obelisk. He said that Brexit is already delivering enormous benefits and opportunities to the country, but then didn't specify what any of them were, and maybe it's just that we don't know them because they go to another school. The only vague thing he hinted at was that we can now pursue trade deals with the world's fastest growing economies, which we could do before, and also we're not one now ourselves because of Brexit. Still, it'll be exciting to see what deals we get next with the new big kids in town and just how many biscuits we can get sent in exchange for them owning every single ounce of our existence. It's a bit of a different tune to the one Sunak was singing last week in his ever-monotone voice that could make even zippity doodah sound like someone doing extensive drilling work. The Prime Minister said in an interview that the UK's reputation has taken a knock, which is an incredible understatement. It's like finding a body at the bottom of a cliff and going, ah, they've just had a bit of a fall. Sunak wouldn't say what that knock to our reputation was down to other than global issues. Yes, definitely global issues that mean our country is going through the worst fall in living standards since records began and nowhere else in the world is. Maybe that is because since Brexit we are now global Britain and so it's only us that global issues affect. Maybe we're such a force on the world stage and just so generous that we've just taken the bullet for everyone, right? Right? It's been a busy week for the Prime Minister, because as well as telling everyone things will be fixed by them all getting worse, he made a surprise visit to Ukraine, probably because they'd have pretended to be out if he'd given them advance notice, and he really hadn't had an invite. He met Eastern European Jeremy Renner and Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky days after the country had been subjected to horrendous missile attacks from Russia. Sunak said that him and Zelensky discussed the most important issues for both countries and global security before pledging £50 million in defence aid to Ukraine. Yes, Ukraine does need help, it's getting quite a lot from the rest of the world, but it is strange that the Prime Minister thinks what's also best for children in Britain is a whole load of drones elsewhere, while they get frostbite from sitting at home. Sure, Timmy, you can't feel your toes anymore and your legs have gone black and blue, but don't worry, somewhere in the rest of the world, we've made sure a young man got shot by a robot. I do think it is good that Britain keeps supporting Ukraine through this terrible, awful time. And you never know, with Britain's help in just 20 years from now, if they're really lucky, we might totally abandon them and then they'll get taken over by the Taliban. Then the Prime Minister filmed himself putting up a football chart on the wall, which was more important than anything else. And he managed to make some meaningless statements about fearing for his daughter's safety on her walk to school, following so many crimes against women and children. Well, I mean, if you will let the Met Police escort her, mate, chances are much higher of something terrible happening. And what I worry about is I bet she's too pushed to even know what a bus is in order to wave one down if she needs it. The Labour Party have been hard at work this week standing up for the British people with Labour leader and the physical embodiment of bumping into your least favourite person at work in the supermarket and then they insist on talking to you, Keir Starmer, saying that he accepts the government's black hole calculation. Yeah, you show those economists that say it doesn't exist, Keir. Sod their numbers and expertise and understanding. What do they know apart from all of it? Thing is, when you're with your peer group and they all say they can see something, it's embarrassing if you disagree, right? I fully bet Starmer was the kid who pretended to sip booze the others got from the shop and then acted drunk completely unconvincingly for hours until no one invited him out ever again. Labour want to be the party of sound finances, which is a great collection of words to put together to mean absolutely nothing. What are sound finances? When you have to pay for Spotify every month? The noise it makes when you open an empty wallet? What Labour say it means is that they'll also be using the made-up concept of an inescapable region of space-time to mean they do austerity as well, just, you know, differently, like with a lemonade top or something. The big Labour policy announcement, though, was that they'd abolish the House of Lords and replace it with a new reformed upper chamber, stripping politicians of the power to appoint people there. This has the potential to be a very good idea, but without any details, I'm quite scared Keir Starmer is just thinking of a US-style Senate, where every four years the British people will elect whichever party's in opposition to have a majority, they'll block all the Commons policies and will be in a constant state of limbo until oblivion. Then again, sitting around doing nothing does appear to be Starmer's battle plan at the very best of times. While Rishi Sunak was trying very hard to make people think he likes football, Starmer was properly convincing them by doing a video listing his favourite football moments, one of which was when England lost to Germany on penalties in 1996. But then I guess a big part of his life so far has been on the side of a team that never quite gets there, so maybe it was inspirational to him. 
The Labour leader was interviewed in Times magazine where it revealed the real Starmer, who it turns out is exactly the same as the one we normally know about and still not very interesting. In it, the Labour leader admitted, totally falling for the internet gag, that he had kissed a Tory and didn't regret it. Great, well done you big man kissing a Tory, look at you. Though I'm still in doubt he doesn't just mean kissing the pinky on a picture of the former Queen from the 1800s. The big question is, if he did kiss a Tory, was it any good or did they put zero effort in in case it gave him any benefits? And more importantly for Labour, if they get into power, would Keir Starmer kiss a working class person or is he only up for fucking them over? Anyway, I suppose in some ways it is very good that we can see Keir Starmer has put passion before politics. And with that sort of attitude, he might not get into government, but he'll definitely, definitely have a great chance of ending up as a contestant on I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Hey, 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 Parpol Broads, another week, another week. They just keep happening these weeks, don't they? So bloody selfish and endless. Are you watching the World Cup? Uh, I'm not, uh, and it's because I'm very much against it being in Qatar, unlike last time when it was held in a friendly nation that promotes LGBTQ plus rights. You know, Russia. Uh, I know people protested about that one at the time, uh, but, you know, it wasn't as covered as much, was it? And I guess we didn't know about it because then Russia were kindly propping up the Conservatives, so it wasn't as much of an issue. It's also, uh, I'm not watching the World Cup because it was on at 1pm today and I was busy writing this, but, you know, I'm I'm not going to watch it mainly out of principle and because I don't like football um which helps the least the next one is in the very lgbtqi plus tolerant and equality strong usa oh well um uh, it is cold and wet outside isn't it and all the things i remember i don't like at this time of year except i did like them you know when i was at home and warm and not in them but now we're playing that fun game like everyone else of don't turn the heating on until you're at the level where you could be found by explorers and then they use your frozen dna to make a park full of duplicate clones of yourself that then goes horribly wrong and sam neil and laura dern have to save everyone um, I'm just being a bit silly and over the top, of course, because there is no way I could get over even a small fence, let alone a huge electric one. Um, we're with Octopus Energy, and I say that not to give them any sort of promotion because they're not paying me uh, for one, and I wouldn't anyway, because fuck energy companies, um, although their customer service is quite good. Um, but they did their Super Saver session last week, and we took part um, because it's great when us people have to make up for the shortcomings in infrastructure brought on by poor governance and greed, but also, you know, it is good for the planet to cut down on energy, isn't it? Um, that's, that's good. Not as good as 12 massive companies just fucking cutting it out with their shitty CO2 emissions. It's hard this ethical life thing isn't it anyway we tried to turn off as many things as we could in the hour which must be obviously very hard for people with medical things they need to have on endlessly uh, but we did it we did it for an hour um and where i failed was i tried to persuade my agent sorry daughter that she also needed to use little to no energy for that hour uh, but it turns out unfortunately you can still shout sing and jump on the sofa like some sort of tiny vandal even in the mostly dark uh, which was a disappointment to me um, worth a try hey and apparently we saved just over one pound of energy so drinks on me lads uh, the drink is rainwater I collected in a paper cup isn't it amazing that a few years ago they predicted 2022 would be all like flying cars and robot chefs but here we are having to sit in the dark for an hour to stop the grid from falling over we have done so well as a species so so bloody well everyone well done round of applause um, thank you absolutely loads this week to Michael who heard my desperate whiny plea last week about this show having no reviews in ages and he fell for it <laughs> I mean sorry he very kindly wrote some nice words on Apple Podcasts thank you Michael very very much appreciated and should any of you fancy doing the same that would also be great uh, apparently even after going for six years now there's still not enough reviews of this podcast on Spotify oh my god to even show them isn't that bleak um, so if you can bear to head to the platform that pays the absolute least to artists then please give us a nice five star review there and maybe one day one day i will get a check for 0.0001p off them that would be nice thanks big times also to connell for the kofi donation and of course if you are somehow with bulging wallets even in these skint times then please buy me a coffee at ko-fi.com forward slash parpool bro or even do it monthly by joining the patreon at patreon.com forward slash parpool bro Right, other things to say this week is that look, I'm obviously aware that there's been a load of news about asylum seekers and immigration at the moment and it's all bleak as fuck from the human rights point of view. Hey, at least you can switch off from it and watch the footy, eh? Oh, oh well. But um, I haven't got a guest on the show lined up to talk about that subject. Why, oh why, would I be so rubbish and untopical? Well, it's on purpose, right? Because I've had a lot of guests talk about it on the show before, um, being brilliantly uh, informative about it and depressingly, absolutely, fuck all has changed, if not got worse. So instead, I tweeted... Um, 
you know, obviously that might not last the week. Uh, I'm not even going to talk about that this time. Um, and I also, whatever else, links to all previous interviews about that subject. And I will pop a link to that thread in the blurb this week if you want to go back and hear brilliant people talk about very sad things on that subject. You know, like every episode. Um, and at some point I will uh, I will do a new chat about it, maybe in the new year. On a less depressing note, well, obviously it depends on your point of view, I suppose, uh, and how much you like me talking slash my words. Um, I was asked questions by excellent telly writer Chris Douche for his writers at various stages of development site and blog, and I wrote very long answers back, and people have been very nice about it. Well, two of them anyway. So I've posted a link to that in the blurb this week if you fancy a read. This week's episode has a Labour-based interview. Yeah, do you remember them? You know, the other lot. Turns out that while being better than this lot, there's... Still shit. Oh, British politics. Choices there for everyone at one end of the political spectrum. I don't often talk about the Labour Party, aka the opposition, aka the other lot on this podcast, mainly because after I've got through the absolute shitstorm the Conservatives have managed to conjure up within just seven days, there's usually only seconds left to try and remind you that any other political parties exist. But we have to, well at least I do, remember that it is necessary to scrutinise those that are likely to be the next lot in charge just as much because, well, otherwise they'll get away with all the awful shit too. It isn't true that all the parties are exactly the same. I mean, for a start, one is blue and the other is red. And those aren't even close on the Dulux colour chart, right? Really different. But also, if you look at fiscal policy, the Conservatives believe, against most economists' advice, that there is a Treasury black hole and austerity is the way forward. Whereas Labour, ah, ah well. Well, the Conservatives, they want to clamp down on boats crossing the Channel without opening any safe routes or refining their immigration system, all while dehumanising those who've risked their lives to come here, while Labour, on the other hand... Ah. Well, look, it will be better with a Labour government rather than a Tory one, not least because just, hey, a change is as good as a rest, isn't it? But it's worth noting that Labour for the last few years seem to have operated on a basis that by doing very little, they'll still win against a crumbling government, and so all their focus should instead be putting off everyone who did vote for them last time. Since Keir Starmer took over as party leader, much effort has been made trying to erase all memory of the Corbyn years that made them so unpopular that they only got 10 million votes across the UK in the 2019 election, compared to the Conservatives' 13 million. Polls since have shown the majority of votes against them were less to do with anti-Semitism accusations, which of course did affect votes in certain areas, but more to do with their wishy-washy stance on Brexit, opting to campaign for a second referendum rather than do, well, anything else. The brainchild, that was, of one Sir Keir Starmer. So lucky they got rid of him. It's a bit like finding a bug in a computer programme and making an update using just that code and absolutely nothing else. The rest of the Labour manifesto, however, in 2019, did prove popular. So popular, in fact, that the Conservatives have been nearly sticking to its promises ever since. Yet, for the Labour Party, their aim has been to focus on not doing any of those, and they have instead been working hard to remove any whiff of left wing from their divisions. While Labour are indeed known for opposing themselves more than any other party, and there are many tales of internal meddling in candidate selections, in recent months this escalated so much that people are getting much less say in which Labour candidate might represent them than they did for new Prime Minister. No, not the new new Prime Minister, the one before, the lying one. No, after the other lying one, and before this lying one. Yes, that one, though the current one they didn't get any... Yeah, anyway, a number of people have been blocked from running to stand as the area's potential Labour MP, with several who are already Labour MPs being told that they'd also have to face a reselection vote. According to Keir Starmer, this is just because he wants MPs who are a high standard and the very best possible for the future. Which does make sense, but when you're telling local constituency parties they can't have who they'd like and people that know the area really well, I wonder if Starmer just meant he'd like a bunch of robots he can control directly from HQ. Should we be watching how Democratic Labour are as a group when they could run the country in the same way? Does rigging votes just show they're ready for government? And does Keir Starmer really do his hair by standing under a plane as it takes off? OK, OK, not the last one. But for the other two, I spoke this week to several-time podcast Maurice McLeod. Previously, I've spoken to Maurice on issues of racism on account of his previous work as part of the brilliant, brilliant Diversified. But this week, we talked all about his role as a Labour councillor for four years at Battersea Park. He was recently blocked to take part in the running to become the next MP for Camberwell and Peckham for what, as you'll hear, are some very silly and vague reasons. You might have seen Maurice pop up talking about this on a fair bit of media in the last few weeks, and I should also say that we spoke before the Camberwell and Peckham candidate was announced. Miata van Buller, uh, I hope I've pronounced that right, was revealed as the winner last week, who by all accounts seems great and may well have won regardless. And the candidate that was parachuted in by the Labour NEC didn't get anywhere near. 
And we also mentioned Ian Byrne in this chat, who was reselected to run as the MP for Liverpool West Derby by his local branch, despite quite a lot of things being thrown against him. So, some happy endings, hopefully. But that doesn't stop this being a very, very important chat about undemocratic decisions with Maurice, who is still amazingly very kind and diplomatic about a party that have, as you'll hear, given him quite a rough deal. And, as we mentioned before, angry people on social media go, well, then you're just going to let the Tories back in then, aren't you? No, not at all. But it is constantly boring how the mindset in the UK is, well, we'll just have the least shit option then, rather than thinking there's nothing to stop us hoping for better, or at least wanting the party that likely will beat the Conservatives to stop being quite so ridiculous. I hope you enjoy. Here is Maurice. Maurice, it's, it's so lovely to have you back on the podcast. And I, I, I said this to you before we started recording. I've got personal bias in this in that I was really, I, I thought you made a great MP. I'm going to put that out there for the listeners, right? <laughs> I'm gutted about it. But before before we get to what's happened with you, I wonder if you could just give us, um, you know, you've been on the podcast before, uh, but not discussing this issue. And I wonder if you could just give us a bit of background and sort of tell me how long you've been a Labour councillor um, at Battersea 4. And, and also if perhaps... Mm. Like factionism was ever an issue when, when you were part of the council or have been part of the council. Yeah, OK. And hello, Tim. And yeah, it's great to be back. I think this is my third time. It is, I'm, I know. I'm like regular now. Um, but so, uh, yeah, I've been I was elected onto Wandsworth Council um, in 2018. So I so I uh, so I've been and I was re-elected this year. So I've been a councillor two terms and obviously uh if you'll remember in Wandsworth um this year we sort of won it from the Conservatives for the first time in 44 years uh, I, you know I've lived there my whole life and I was you know I was, a, I was a small boy the last time Labour were in control here in, in Wandsworth so it's a big deal um and I, and I think and I'm really glad you ask about factionalism um because I'm not going to pretend that it doesn't exist in Battersea uh, you know Labour has gone through quite big shifts in 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 its leadership and its way of thinking over the last sort of you know five six seven years so so yes there there, there were some disagreements about policy and whatever but certainly among the councillors and this is what I think is quite amazing um the, the group of councillors both in opposition last time and the group that's been elected this time it comes from right across the party I mean there's there's you know arch sort of Blairites to to people who are probably on the left of Corbyn and 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 we work really well together, you know. Um, I'm not saying we don't disagree, but it's not normally on factional lines. It's normally about, you know, personalities or or you know, all the normal things that come into politics. Um, what I think's been really noticeable is because we've been uh, because we've had this 44 years of Tory thing hanging over our head, we've all been like we all realize what that does for our communities and so whatever side of the party you're on we've all been pushing to make sure that that labor uh is in control in Wandsworth and and we've achieved that and 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 I'm really pleased about some of the really progressive policies we're bringing through building building a thousand council homes all that sort of thing we're doing the stuff that I want that I got into politics to do um and I and 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 yeah, I think it's really noticeable that that factionalism just does not come into it. Um, you know, uh, almost all of the um, you know, when my fellow councillors, obviously, the 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 MP selection was in Southwark, but but um, my fellow councillors in Wandsworth, when they heard what had happened, you know, almost all of them got in touch personally to sort of say how awful they thought it was there's been councillors not on the left you know speaking publicly in the town hall saying saying lovely things about me uh, so it's so I'm really you know and it's really humbling you know uh, um, I know politics is all about ego and oh I'm the one make me the person um, I'm not really like that so having people who I didn't think were necessarily on my side say really you know be really appalled by what's happened and 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 come to my support has been really um yeah it's been it's been really lovely and really quite humbling so on to what's happened um you know you were running Harriet Harman stepping down as MP for uh Campbell and Peckham 
you were running to be the candidate. Um, and obviously there was still the selection process to go. There were other people that were also um, running. Uh, and, you know, it, for, from just the appearance of seeing everything you're doing, I watched your campaign videos. I mean, you, you've been there your whole life. You know the whole area. You seem like a real sort of shoe in for someone that would be suitable to get the job as, as far as I, as far as me, just a per- person in the public was concerned. But you, you were blocked from standing. So what, what happened and what reasons were you given for not being uh, allowed to take part? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a real shame. And, and, and thank you again for saying, saying lovely things. I mean, from where I was sitting, um, I just wanted to have a chance to let members vote on me. That That's, that's literally, I wanted to make my argument to members, which I think was a slightly different argument to, to any of the other candidates in that I was, uh, uh, undeniably left wing, and I was standing on a socialist, anti racist platform. I was talking about supporting striking workers, and uh, you know, really being there for our communities, which I know all all MP candidates will say. But I think there, there is a particular left wing perspective, which is the same thing that excited, you know, the likes of me to get into parliamentary politics. I never thought I would do, but Labour seemed to be interested in that. Um, anyway, so, so sorry, I, I, I've gone off, I've gone off target a little bit, but the um, the so, so, the, so, so the process is so you uh, when a seat becomes available, as you say, Harriet Harman uh, will be standing down after nearly forty years, I think it is, as, as an MP. Um, uh, when a seat becomes available, uh, anyone anyone in the country who's a Labour member with twelve months uh, um, good standing and no sort of outstanding legal issues can can put their hat into the ring um there's then a a a process where that's sort of siphoned down to be a handleable number and normally you'd take out anyone that that can't prove local links or hasn't got a history of doing stuff in the labor party or uh, you know there's 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 obvious things that you take someone out uh, out for um then what's supposed to happen is um, there's a, a, a long list in process where you take all these possible candidates and you go, right, let's get it down to something like six or seven, just so we can really, so members can really start looking at it. Um, now there's a thing called, um, now I, I got supported by two unions, ASLEF uh, and Unite, who both, uh, it's very complicated, but they both have the right to say who should go onto the long list. So, so if they are, if you are their candidate, in theory, you don't need to go through the bit where they go, oh, is this person good enough for the area? Is this person, has this person got a history of doing Labour stuff? Because, you know, two affiliated unions have said, yeah, this is our this is our person. Unfortunately with me, just before that happens, there's a thing called due, due diligence where um, the, the, they sort of troll your social media to, to find, to see if you're crazy, basically, right. to say if you said <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> to see if you've said stuff that's going to really um, embarrass the party, or if you've, you know, if you've got, if you're a misogynist or whatever, if you if you've got this really crazy um, social media uh, profile, or if you there's stuff about you that they need to know, they did a search. Now I I was really relaxed because I've been through those searches twice as a councillor, once as a GLA candidate where I stood last year and, and lost by ninety votes. And as the Vauxhall parliamentary candidate, as I did in uh, uh, two years ago, uh, where I was long listed. So, so I was really quite confident that I haven't done or said anything that would stop me from being on a long list. Um, but at the interview, they introduced four things that they wanted to talk to me about. Uh, and I can happily talk about all of those, but I think they're all, they were all pretty nonsense. They're all from at least four years ago. Um and uh, and then after my interview, like a few hours later, I got an email just saying, sorry, you're not going through. And that's literally it. I didn't get a chance to speak to members or to argue my case any further. You're just sort of booted out. So it's quite it's quite um, it's quite disrespectful. It's really hard as someone that is a working councillor that, you know, I think being a councillor is the hardest job in 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 politics because you're. You don't really get paid very much. I mean, it's 10 grand a year or something expenses. And you really are at the front line. You're meeting residents, you're in their homes, you're you're really dealing with people in 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 really awful situations in a way that sometimes MPs don't have to because they're a level above and they've got an office, they've got a team around them and they've got profile. It's a different type of role. Um, and and so 
in my mind, I kind of proved to Labour that I wasn't, that I was trustworthy, that I'm, you know, I go on the media, I do lovely interviews with people like you, I, I do all sorts of things that that I think uh, don't make me seem too crazy. I, I was just going to uh, say that, and I know you said um, you don't need to go into all the all the four reasons I gave you, but I, from what I've read, one of them was simply liking a tweet, I think, by Caroline Lucas, which, I mean, if that's it, as you know, th- th- it is ridiculous. I don't, we don't really need to point that out. Just, but, but th- people like yeah. all sorts of things. Sometimes I like a tweet because I might be saving it to remember it for a joke I'm saying on a or whatever. That that seems like such a petty petty thing to have on a list a- against you it, it's absolutely ridiculous i mean i mean um and then and i'll i think it's even more ridiculous because i wasn't i wasn't a sit-in councillor at the time i was you know as i think you even interviewed me around about then i was working mm-hmm. with media diversified i was a political commentator my job was to talk about what politics what politicians have said and whether i agreed or didn't agree and the tweet from caroline lucas if i remember was something about defending the NHS from being sold off. It was a perfectly, it was a, it was a tweet that would be would be great coming out of any Labour politician's mouth. So it's not, it, it, yeah, it, it was ridiculous. And and, and the reason I uh, uh, mentioned it because there are there are things on the list. But the reason I mentioned that one because it's to me that that shouldn't even be um, that's not that I, I'm I'm embarrassed that that was even brought up in the interview because that's that's nothing. Um, and, and I'd and I'd argue at least two of the other ones were that as well. The, the 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 I think the thing that they will fall back on is that I made a mistake about four years ago. So I mean that's the there was a a, a vote in the council, um, and it was on IRA, so it was obviously very contentious. Um, and at the time of a, there's a thing called a division vote where you all have to be in the council and you say your name. And it goes on and it goes on to the register. I wasn't in the room at the time of that vote. And the Tories kind of spun it to be some some uh, uh, principled walkout where I'd, you know, and it just wasn't the case. But, um, you know, the fact is I was not in the room and it was down to my naivety as a councillor. Um, I'd been in I'd been a councillor for a, a few months at that point. Um, and but yeah, try watching a council meeting and work if you if you're a normal human and working out what the hell's going on. Um I, I, I challenge <laughs> But also, okay. you know, I think one of the things that that is is uh, really under underrated is is the fact that, like, I, you know, I've talked to you before. You you talk like a normal human being. You've got this issue. There, there's something they've brought up there. You've just answered it. You've you've backed it up, <laughs> and you said, "Oh, it was a mistake," which is something we don't often hear politicians saying at all. Um, even if it is something that they're not happy with, the fact that you're very happy to point out what happened and that it. You, you you didn't know what quite what you were doing is is <laughs> really refreshing you know um, and and that's what we should have more I mean that's the I was, I was going to say that that's the point though Tim and isn't it so so it, it you know what I what I would love to to have happened so if these 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 issues in my murky past were so big and and important that they stopped me from even being considered as an MP. Let me put those in front of members. Let, you know, say, okay, Morris is on the long list, but there's these things that you might want to look at or question him on. And I would love to have explained to members, but to most that I think most members would have gone, well, none of this is important because none of it was. That, that's the bottom line is why it's all sort of done and why I've made a lot of uh, noise and I've, you know, I've written about it in The Guardian. I've probably, you know, people said, oh, don't, you know, just leave it. Don't, don't add to the controversy. But, I think if you if you do all this stuff in quiet in quiet little rooms and there's all sorts of rumors floating around about why I was really blocked, um, that's I'm, I'm not having that. I'm not having people suggesting all sorts of hideous reasons why I may have been blocked. So I, I want I want this out in the public. And the fact that Labour didn't do it means that I have to do it, it means I have to say, look, these are the reasons that they said I was blocked. Which is really exhausting for you as well. I mean, there's been his, Labour do have a history of parachuting candidates into constituencies, um, blocking CLP choices. You know, Tom Watson was very known for being part of that, and um, and but it seems like there's there's a lot at the moment. It seems like it's happening a lot in in the current batch. There's just I was reading about Ian Byrne in Liverpool, who's very popular, but suddenly being told that he has to go through a reselection. Zara Sultan had to go through a reselection. It's happening to a lot of candidates who were pretty steady, not only with their CLP, but with local membership, with local people. Um, do you feel like the sort of reselection process is, is particularly bad right now? It, this, I mean, this seems uh, like a real sort of um, 
principle for Labour to just go through and kind of clear out the rafters, as it were, and have only the people. I think Keir Starmer said they just want candidates who are prepared for the future, which is a very vague statement <laughs> <laughs> if I ever heard one. God. Um, sorry, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> in, in, in a word, um, so, so hang on, I think it's, it's, we should be honest, I think there's always been a, a desire by whoever is in control of Labour. Labour, uh, like the Conservatives, as as we're seeing, you know, the, we, the, our democracy builds these huge parties that are supposed to be broad church and have all sorts of views in them. Uh, um, and they sometimes don't sit that well together. And I think Labour's always been a bit of a push-pull between who, what's in favour at the at, at the time. What what I've not seen though, um, and maybe I'm maybe it's because I've not been as deeply into politics as 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 as, as maybe I am at the moment. But what I've not seen is is uh, it, you know this absolute deliberate and um, desire to control from the centre that that's like kind of unshakable. It's not it's not just the whole oh, you know, we don't favour this candidate, we like that one, or it's like, no, we're going to block this one, we're going to do that, and we're going to, you know, only last night uh, uh, in Camwell and Peckham, they decided on three candidates for the shortlist, this is can- the contest I was in, and and the, the, the NEC, the sort of ruling body of Labour, said, no, no, we want four, and sacked the whole selection committee and put someone else wow. in, which, um, I mean, so that's no, so that means no local input, into I just think it, this sort of thing is appalling. Labour really, really needs to, and it, it's 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 not necessary. Is is the is the is the thing. I think that the the challenge is that Labour are so, and understandably, I'm not. You know, you know, I am on the Corbyn side of Labour. I, I absolutely own that. I have no problem with that. Um, and and I get it that the new leadership isn't and wants to distance itself from that because it sees that as a losing strategy. Fine, okay, I. I I don't agree with that, but that if that's your, what you've come to. But the, the, the problem is that they're so determined to say we're not anything to do with Corbyn, that anyone that's even vaguely supportive of him or has, you know, has similar uh, ways of thinking, which is a lot of the party and a lot of the country, 13 million people voted, you know, even though it's like the worst, uh, you know, um, uh, um, Labour performance ever, but 13 million people voted for, for Corbyn's policies. And what, what Labour are saying is no one who even has those ideas can be anywhere near us. And they're really trying to, as you say, um, for, for sitting MPs or, or people that, you know, Emma Dent Cobra's an MP two years ago, and now she's been told she's not good enough to, to even run as an MP. This is, it, it goes against common sense. I mean, I, I think we kind of assume there's going to be a bit of political it's going to be harder for someone that's not in favour to, to do well. Sure, that makes sense. But but this absolute um, refusal to accept member democracy is is it's going to be bad in the long run. I fear. Yeah. Well, it's, it's surely got to make people wonder what the point of joining a political party is. What the point of getting involved in politics is if you're say even at a local level doesn't have any meaning like that's you know that that's the least you want if you're going to be part of a local group to at least say well i can put my vote towards which candidate represents us in this area exactly that and 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 a lot of the um uh, the campaign that we were running in campbell and peckham we had 120 volunteers so so we it was very quickly run we in about four weeks we sort of set up and built a website did a video and had 120 volunteers uh from from you know local volunteers uh, um who were all really pushing for the ideas we were talking about. And, and my, a lot of my conversations since have been saying to people, look, still stay involved. And, you know, you still get a chance. Yeah, there are some good candidates. I have no issue with the other candidates in Campbell and Peckham. They are good people that are standing there who I'm sure will be good MPs. Um, so go and have your say in that. But people feel, as you say, they feel like, well, they're not listening to our say. It doesn't, they don't care what they're going to, they want who they want. And I feel like I'm, you know, my job's to turn up and stuff envelopes and knock on doors occasionally. That's not, that's not a membership. It's you're really throwing the baby out of the bathwater if you ignore the brilliant activists. I've met some amazing people in Labour. I mean, some really jaw-droppingly good community-based people who've kind of given their whole lives to supporting the people that we want to support. And I fear that Labour's closing the door on all of those people um, because of this desire not to be like Corbyn it's uh, you know I, ho- I hope 
we get over it. I hope that we look to, I hope we do look to the future as, as, uh, as Keir says, rather than dwelling on trying not to be the past. How do you feel, you know, because I think one of my concerns about Labour is a, a lot of the recent policy has has not been sort of what I'd recognise from Labour. It's been very, uh, you know, I don't want to go for the all parties of the same nonsense, but, but it's very, you know, the rhetoric on immigration, um, <clears throat> there was a lack of reaction to the Ford report. There's There's been a lot of stuff that's made me go, this is disconcerting for me as a voter. Um, I want to see, you know... Ad- adequate difference between the parties on a number of issues so that I can have a choice when I vote. Um, you know, how do, how are you feeling about it with, with your politics? And, and do you think this kind of change is going to help them electorally when they're shutting out people who want to help them and then they're, they're pushing for policies that are applying to people who are, who are probably just going to vote Conservative anyway? <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a really good point. I, th- I think I should say, though, I mean, I, I'm what, despite you know, what's happened to me and what I see going on uh, with Labour around the country and, and various selections, despite all of that, um, I absolutely want a Labour government. Mm. I, I absolutely want an end to to Tories in government. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm in no doubt that um, a, a Labour party run by Keir Starmer or or anybody, to be honest, um, would, would is going to be better um um than than a tour than 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 what the Tories have been doing to the country, which I think is, you know, I think with the the Tories, the mask's fallen off. They, you know, the thing about who they're supporting has fallen off and it's really obvious now. Uh the the challenge I think for Labour and so and so, and so yes, yeah, so I'm not going to sit here and say, oh no, it doesn't make any difference. I do think it does. I think some of the things that we're talking about um when it comes to the Green New Deal, some of the stuff, I know that it's going to be a, a battle, but I think that we can get Labour into a position to, to keep up, catch up with the public, basically, on things like nationalisation and understanding that um, that things like the, the the disputes that are going on, they're not people protesting against the country. These are these are workers who are... The, the cost of living pro- crisis is happening because the, the gap between what people earn and, and what things cost has got bigger and bigger. That's what the cost of living crisis is. So, so we've got... Uh, um, the unions fighting to 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 improve everyone's wages to get you know to give the country a pay rise. This is all stuff that that Labour should and I still think can get behind. Even though I know I, I don't think some of this is in maybe Keir's instincts and he's very cautious and his his whole approach is to appear, appear like a prime minister in waiting and and to him that means you know you 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 don't go on protests you don't support anything that looks a bit messy. Um, fortunately, the party is bigger than one person. Fortunately, the party includes yeah, all those activists and unionists and, and what have you. Um, now, yes, I, I of course I'd like the party to be a lot more radical. Of course, you know, even when um, so, so Keir talked in his speech about the uh, sort of Great British Energy, which will be a nationalised um, energy producer that will focus on renewables. Great, really good idea. Except because you're not taking into account the supply side, because you're, you know, we're still going to have all these different companies charging us what they want, you know, as consumers. So you you haven't kind of done the whole bit. And it's because you're kind of resistant to the ideology of nationalisation. Um, and so, unfortunately, yes, it will improve things, but it, it won't improve things as much as it could. And I worry, uh, I, I actually am I'm quite confident about Labour getting into power whenever the next election is. I find it really hard to imagine the Tories. I mean, I'm, Rishi Sunak may be able to pull some credibility back. I don't know. Um, I find it hard to see them coming back to a position where they win. I think the challenge for Labour isn't necessarily winning the next election. It's it's running the country in a way that actually brings the change people are crying out for. Because if Labour get in and don't do some of these more radical things and aren't willing to look at wealth taxes and aren't, you know, and don't increase um, the minimum wage and do all the th- sorts of things that the left are kind of demanding that they do, I think we'll we'll have a problem. I think that the, the country will be like, hang on, so we've got rid of the Tories and you guys, I don't feel, I don't feel that much different. It will be better, but I, I, I worry that if they, um, if, if this um, phobia about socialism carries on, if this phobia about anti-racist politics carries on, 
Labour will find itself not being the transformative government that it needs to be. And that, that's 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 what concerns me, because then I don't know what happens. I don't know what happens at that moment. You know, all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, some sort of far right movement growing again. I wouldn't be. So there's all sorts of things that could happen in this country that would concern me. That's I mean, it's, it's something that really worries me as well, because I think, it's you know, it's interesting you sort of said, what what the left would like to do, but so much of this is actually what people what you know the, the huge public support across political spectrum for nationalising energy for nationalising the rail. It's not just a kind of left or right thing, and it strikes me as funny, especially when we've got figures. For example, I mean, it, you know, he's always the one reference, but Mick Lynch, people who are coming out and saying these things that are gaining huge public support, and strikes have got more public support than ever before. That I find it funny that that you still have a Labour Party that are resistant, or or at least the leaders of Labour Party are resistant to saying that. Publicly, when you think, yeah. I find it strange because you think, why wouldn't you just say, "No, I'm with you. I'm with the people. This is the people's, but it's the workers' party." We, you know, I mean, even as a politician, it's like, okay, so forget the ideology. Then, even as a politician, you'd think you would, you, you know, I went to um, uh, enough is enough is the sort of uh, union backed uh, campaign that's kind of trying to bring all this together. I went to one of their uh, their launch in 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 Clapham a couple of months back. It was amazing. It was like, oh wow, I forgot politics could feel like this again. And there's a real buzz in the room, and people really want to do stuff. If I, if I was the Labour leadership, which chances are, you know, I wouldn't be anywhere near it. But if I were the Labour leadership, I, I'd be looking at that, going, oh, oh, okay, here's something that we need to, you know, we can ride on this. This is. You know, even if you don't believe in it, whatever you you should be able to see the groundswell. As you say, these are these aren't sort of fringe lunatic policies. These are these are really widely accepted things that Labour could be could could be um could be leading on. And instead, uh, for some reason, there's a real reticence because oh, that sounds a bit Corbyn-y. Or that sounds I, I don't know what the what the fear is. Um, um, yeah, and I hope we get over it quickly. I hope we get over it quickly. Maybe the new poll lead will give the leadership more confidence and so it won't feel the need to be quite so defensive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, th- Thank you for coming on and talking about this, uh, Morris. You know, I've, I know you've had to deal with it recently. and sort of, I, I do appreciate that. And also, like, I'm a big stickler, but I should say that like you, I really want the Tories out. I will vote Labour next time. I just, uh, I'm also aware that there's this whole chat, especially online about like, oh, well, you can't criticise them. You just want the Tories in, which I think is massively unhealthy. I think we should be able to criticise uh, everyone. I, some years ago, I'm going to go off on a slight tangent here before I ask you the last question, but I did a stand-up gig for um, the Norwich Labour constituency and I remember they all laughed when I insulted the Tories, all laughed when I joked about Lib Dems and I joked about them and they booed me and got very upset and didn't <laughs> want me to do the gig. And I said, well, you have to laugh at yourselves, otherwise <laughs> this isn't, you know, you're not going to do very well. We have to be able to laugh at our politics. Anyway, so I appreciate you coming on to talk about this. Um, And and the last question, which, uh, you know, I've asked you this before about other things, but apart from yourself, who do you think listeners should check out? Um, Mainly for kind of info on Labour, I guess, because the news is 99% about all the damage the Conservatives are causing. (laughs) And it is important to remember that other politics and other political parties exist. Is there anywhere that you go for info on your own party? Um, it's 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 a good one, isn't it? Uh, so, I mean, I I'm a fan of Navara. I I I like Navara Media. Um, um, they, I guess uh, they've almost become the 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 sort of I don't know the the BBC for for the for the left in that that you kind of go to them each day for 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 a, cent, for a touch of reality when 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 maybe the party's starting to freak you out a little bit. Um, Labour list is good for. I mean, Labour list is good if you are, if you really are into the nitty gritty. I, I, you know, I've literally just stood for for to be an MP, and I'm not as into the machinations <laughs> of every different process that that Labour list will 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 talk about. But if you really want to know what's going on, then 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 they're a good shout. But other than that, to, to be honest, I find myself following you know individuals. You know, my colleague Aidan Dickerdom is is brilliant. There's people that just say interesting things but I, I think go go local look at who's doing things in your area and follow them that, that that's the way i'd go
Thanks to Maurice for making his third appearance on this show. And as he said, uh, he's basically a regular now, isn't he? Uh, I'm not sure that's of much benefit to him and his career, but I'm very, very grateful that he's still up for coming on this show. It's great to talk to him. Uh, you can find Maurice at MoWords on Twitter for as long as that site lasts. And he's also uh, at MoWords on Instagram too. And he's still a counsellor in Battersea Park because he is a better person than I am. I'd have been handing that membership card back in with various big swears written on it in a series of imaginative colours. I'm all good for guests up until the Christmas break now, but if you've got suggestions for who I might need to chat to in 2023, what will the big issues be then? How do we stop robots taking over or can we survive living only on moss? It'll probably be one of those, likely likely the latter. But if you've got other ideas, and in particular who I should talk to about them, drop me a line at parpolbro on Twitter and Facebook or by emailing me at partlypoliticalbroadcast at gmail.com. <laughs> All finito for this week's Parpol Bro, but thank your lovely faces for tuning in. And should those very same faces be true and kind and eyes that are gentle and so would mean you wouldn't get hired to work in the home office, then maybe you could use them to articulate and gesture to other kind souls that this here show exists. Or, you know, just use whichever social media is still online and that way you don't actually have to talk to anyone. But either way, please do recommend it to others. If you can afford to, donate to the ko-fi.com forward slash Parpol Bro to buy me a coffee or join the patreon.com forward slash Parpol Bro to teach me how to make a coffee no wait i already know just just buy me monthly coffee that's easier and if you so fancy it please give us a nice review on apple Podcasts, spotify or anywhere else that podcasts hide credit where it's due to Acast, my brother last skeptic and cat day and this will be back next week when keir starmer reveals that when he says he kissed a tory he just meant the picture of margaret thatcher by his bed every night before he goes to sleep bye this week's show is sponsored by Rishi Sunak's World Cup Guide, featuring top tips on how all the top ball kicker men are, the top five moments that happened on whatever that grass bit is called, how best to sell arms to the worst human rights abusers, and spot the ball. Oh wait, sorry, there isn't one due to necessary cuts. Rishi Sunak's World Cup Guide, from the man that knows just how all the ball foots work, like you do, those real people, and he's just like you as he watches it on his giant home cinema in one of his 12 homes, sipping only the finest champagne, like a real lad.